And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection. I'm your host, Robert Picto. In the 1950s, the BC and Canadian governments and the Aluminum Company of Canada promoted Kitimat around the world. The Kitimat project was constructed from scratch, and the result was the largest smelter in the world and a premier community to go with it. Kitimat would be British Columbia's first planned community, a suburban utopia so desirable to the worker that a stable workforce would be maintained. On today's Open Connection, we open our archives to bring you this story from 1989. It was crowded, colorful, and fascinating. A bit like a mini World's Fair. The aromas which wafted out of the cafeteria at Mount Elizabeth High School were not the usual ones of hot dogs and popcorn. Nothing like that. There was East Indian food at its best. And customers who knew just what they wanted. It was definitely the place in town to have a special lunch. If calories are a concern, it was a good idea to not even go near the dessert table the women of the German Canadian Club dream up. A little bit of heaven for the sweet of tooth. Children should get used to different types of food early in life. And these young ones enjoyed every bite. There were many other types of exotic food and wonderful homemade Italian pizza. And always more desserts. Some of the food booths ran totally out of supplies. It's not hard to figure out why. The community's children got an opportunity to play some international games. Though some were not quite sure they wanted to get into the act at first. Everything from the universally understood boot scramble to the walkabout game from Australia, where balls substitute for boomerangs and everyone tries to fill up their tucker bag with game. There was an impressive gallery display that provided a good opportunity for new Canadians to show off their heritage. One of the most colorful displays was set up by the Finnish Canadian Club. Annelie Jacola tells us a little bit about her former home. Uh, we came uh, to Kirimet from the southern um, part of Finland. I was born in, in the middle of Finland, and my uh, mother's um, relative, my mother's side of the family lives in Lapland, and uh, what's at this place? There are some very uh, beautiful uh, lap embroideries over there. What can you tell me about them? Yes, uh, the men's hats all have four corners. They represent the four winds. Lapland is very open for all the winds. So uh, men had this privilege of having the winds in their hats. And the ladies' hats uh, were the round ones, uh, the blue ones over there, and the red ones with the pom-pom. <laughs> And the, the red and, and blue are the traditional lap colors? Uh, they picked the colors for the costumes uh, from uh, Northern Lights. So um, all the lights would, uh, they had on the sky, they had them on their costumes. A lovely old hand-woven sled blanket made by her grandmother was front and center in the display. Mrs. Yakula says she speaks only Finnish to her children that way, they must learn the language of their parents. Just around the corner was a collection of clothes and utensils from Fiji. One wonders how people survive the weather shock of life in northwestern BC. The Portuguese community are a major part of the ethnic makeup of Kitimat. There was an attractive collection of ceramic and handmade items. Estrella Nunes shows off her crochet work, a traditional craft that most of the Portuguese women 
both young and old, are expert at. Estrella Andrade shows off a shepherd's blanket from the south of the country, where one can still find shepherds who tend their sheep at night. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thank you for staying with us. According to historical accounts, the Tini Kling dance originated during the Spanish occupation in the Philippines. Rice farmers on the islands usually set up bamboo traps to protect their fields, yet the Tini Kling birds dodged their traps. Locals imitated the birds' movement, and supposedly that's how this dramatic traditional folk dance was born. Let us return to the archives to witness Kitimat students performing this dance. Finikling is a dance from the Philippines that has been taught to Nachaco school students by Eros Denning for 24 years. Smart footwork is definitely needed here. Everyone enjoyed a taste of the Punjab. And from the South American continent, Janet and Carlos Aguilla perform some Peruvian dances. These onlookers may be doing the same thing in the years to come. The whole audience joined in for the rousing Mexican hat dance performed by April Gonzalez and Kane Gutierrez. Special guest came from the Chinese, Italian, and British consulates in BC. Surprisingly enough, Brian Watkins had never been to a multicultural festival before. Yes, I think that's uh, probably right. I can't recall another one, either here in British Columbia or indeed anywhere else where I've served. Fascinated by it. What surprised you most? I think the enthusiasm and the way the children, clearly from many different ethnic backgrounds, all uh, work so very hard together to put on a performance which clearly their parents and friends and all the other adults here, including me, thoroughly enjoyed. And this is now your second visit to Kitimat, I believe? Yes, absolutely right. I was here in uh, 1987 
when I was doing a, a tour around Terrace, Kitimat and Prince Rupert. And this seemed to me to be a splendid opportunity to come back to Kitimat. A small but hard-working committee puts the whole thing together. Last year, the uh, Multicultural Committee, I think, were a bit taken aback by the success of the first festival. Would you agree? Yes, very much so. Uh, it started off as an idea uh, in the past three or four years, and it finally saw fruition last year. And a very small committee, five, ten people got together, and we were just overwhelmed last year by the response of the various groups in the community, by the uh, children in the schools, by the teachers, uh, and really by the ethnic groups. So it was astounding last year, yes. There are more groups participating this year as well. A lot of different groups, yes. Uh, some people participated in the food fair last year and didn't participate in the gallery. This year it's a little bit different. They're participating in the gallery and perhaps not in the food fair. But we've seen uh, this year a, uh, a more diverse ethnic background and folks coming out and, and partaking of this week's festivities. I'm always amazed at the children. It's just, it's just phenomenal. I know I was watching the performance this, uh, this afternoon and uh, the world with the children holding hands. And uh, it certainly bodes well for the future of the country and uh, for the world when we can get that sort of cooperation and that feeling that was generated here today in, in the auditorium. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. Cuisines act as an expression of cultural identity as they are passed on to other generations as tradition. With every geographical shift, we come across new people and with them, their countries or native places food. In fact, cooking in the traditional cuisine at a different place becomes a way for them to keep their culture alive as they migrate to newer locations. Let us return to the archives to bring you this story from 1991. People started arriving early in order to get the best possible choice of the scrumptious food from 11 different countries. It was a day to forget about diets and enjoy, and hundreds and hundreds of people of all ages did just that. The tortilla factory proved to be a favorite, and modern griddles make the preparation much easier than in the old days. They used to have those uh, open fires, and then they, have a, they had a, a round grill, and put it on top of the fire, just grill like this, but homemade grill, eh? And then uh, you will cook them there, with the fire on the, on the bottom. They're made from just a plain dough, flour, lard, baking powder mixed with warm water, but the meat-filled burritos were a hit, especially with the kids. Sometimes it took quite a while to decide among the mouth-watering offerings, such as the food prepared by the Greek ladies. And the display of German torts could have satisfied the sweetest tooth. The Chinese community decided to provide a taste treat with dumplings especially prepared in Vancouver, frozen and shipped to Kitimat, so that if one hadn't had the chance to taste dim sum, now was the opportunity. Uh, this is a general term for dim sum, and uh, actually they, we call it uh, siu mai, okay? And dim sum is just a general term for a kind of snack. Yeah. <laughs> It's always a very friendly affair with lots of different languages being spoken, including how are you in Chinese. Ni hao. These delightful <laughs> young girls are members of a new Chinese dance group. This is actually our costume, but we have pants um, um, for the dance tonight. Oh, so you're part of the new Chinese uh, dance troupe that's been formed. So how long have you been dancing? One year. One year, I guess. One yeah, one year. year. And what's your name? Joyce. I'm in. Vicky. The very proper English cream teas being served here could rival the famous ones provided in Victoria at the Empress Hotel. And these teachers from a local school are raising money for an African foster child with the proceeds. We are hoping to be able to make enough money to send this uh, to... Uh, Alishus, who is our foster child in Africa, and um, he really, uh, I'm sure, would enjoy being here with everybody else. 
and everyone wants to sample the food from a country other than their own. So you're serving English cream teas and eating burritos. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? We're all multicultural, I hope. One of the most popular items proved to be the barbecued pork, prepared by the Filipino Canadian Club. The men were doing most of the cooking, but that wouldn't have been the case back in their homeland. No, it's the woman. <laughs> now here in Canada, they have to do the barbecuing. <laughs> yeah. So they're changing. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what they get being westernized. They have to do it themselves too, you know. The Kitimat School Board has recently adopted a multicultural policy, reflecting the increasingly diverse nature of the school population, and literally hundreds of children took part in the celebration. The school district is committed to promoting such activities. It is important that ties with one's cultural heritage not be lost nor taken for granted. We all, each and every one of us, no matter what part of the world we have come from, have a wealth of experience to share with and learn from one another. That is why we are here today, to expand our minds and our hearts without ever physically passing beyond the perimeter of our town. What a potentially productive way to spend a winter's day. The theme of the festival was weddings and ceremonies, and the Luso Canadian Club had a display of clothes and articles that a bride would collect for her trousseau, and also some beautiful linens that had been handmade in Kitimat. Japan has many special ceremonies, and at their booth, some Japanese families showed off articles sent from Japan on the birth of a son. In Japan, they like to have a son as a first. And since I had a son, she, uh, my friend made this and sent it to me. And what about the uh, helmet? Helmet, uh, I got it from uh, my husband's family as a symbol of, for the boy to be, grow up to be strong and healthy. And so, here it is. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Lace has long been a treasured decorative element in fashion, especially bridal fashion. Cherished for its delicate workmanship and airy patterns, lace has been worn as an adornment since the 15th century. In this final segment of Open Connection, we return to the archives to see this demonstration of lace making. One of the most enjoyable aspects of the festival was the demonstrations. The art of lace making has delighted women around the world for centuries, and now there's a revival of the craft of making bobbin lace. I'm doing what they call a hole stitch tape, and you do a hole stitch with four movements on your bobbins. You only work on four. When you come to the edge, you do a twist on it so that when you take all the pins out, it doesn't all disappear into a heap of threads again. The piece being worked on here is a small animal design, which can be completed in a matter of days. Edgings can take much longer, however. If you're doing an edging lace, of course, like on some of the other pillows, it can take you an hour, hour and a half to do about an inch. It depends on the width of the work that you're on. Interest in many other crafts is also being rekindled, and many feel like Mrs. Baxter. I think a lot of people have got kind of tired of plastic and things that wear out. It's the same in this country, the great revival in quilting, isn't it? And I think a lot of people now perhaps have a little more time to spare and want to take up something that's a practical use and at the same time a real hobby. The Baxters are on a visit from England, but they have a very long-standing Kitimat connection. Well, my husband came up in 1951. I followed him in 1952, and we were in Kitimat until 60. Um, my husband was on the first council, I was on the first school board, and the children all grew up here, all left when we went back to England, and have all returned. And I have all my three sons here and all my grandchildren. And of course we have Baxter Street. Yes, definitely. 
the heritage spinners are very familiar to many people as they demonstrate their skills during the summer at the Chamber of Commerce tourist booth. A few of them have been spinning together for about 10 years. After the wool is carded, you can comb it into a roving, and this is called a roving, and that just makes it easier to spin and pack for shipping. And from there, we actually go into the spinning. They also carry on the ancient craft of felting, a process the Afghans and Turks practiced to make the huge tents they used to live in. This is done with, uh, you, you card the wool into large bats, and then you place one bat going one direction, the next bat going the opposite direction, and the third bat on top of that going the first direction again. Then you can put colored wools on top, and you can sew it between two cotton pieces. And then you do everything to it that you're not supposed to do to wool. <laughs> scrub it, put it in very hot soapy water, then into cold water and, and just scrub it. And then it turns it into felt, which is very, very soft. This piece of felt, Sylvia made, and there's Angora wool in it as well as sheep's wool. So it's and, so, and, and this is lovely when it's made up into vests and yeah. so on. Yes, and it can be made into slippers and mitts and all kinds of interesting things. But it's very, very soft, very, very warm because you have so much wool that's shrunk down on itself. In homes all over Kitimat now are simple scrolls with Chinese characters on them, made by members of the Chinese community as they showed off the ancient art of calligraphy. One of the most interesting demonstrations on a wedding theme was the hand painting that's practiced in India and Pakistan before weddings and other special occasions. The thick paste, which is fragrant, is allowed to dry before being brushed off to reveal the pattern. It is uh, from dried henna that we make this paste and uh, added different ingredients into it to deepen the color of the henna that will come out. And uh, this can be, you know, this is sort of a part of a bridal ceremony that we have in India and Pakistan. And this is a, a very um, much still observed ceremony, still to the day. And it is called Mehndi, Mehndi ceremony. The custom is about 100 years old, and the idea is to cover the entire hand with symbols. It's an old tradition, but still just as modern in today's world in India and Pakistan as it was before. The effect of um, it is, it just is a compulsory aspect of every bride in India and Pakistan to have this um, done before they get married. Not only the brides, but also the guests that are a part of the culture, part of the wedding, to have that done. The wedding guests also decorate their hands, and the practice has a lot of significance. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictel.